Meat Cad Podcast serves as another conduit between academia and the meat industry through conversations with talented and brilliant meat scientists. These discussions help foster and improve communication and knowledge dissemination within the meat science community. Hello, folks. Welcome to the Meat Pad Podcast. My name is Francisco Nahara. I'm your host today. Uh, we have today, we have a very special episode. It is a pleasure to have, I'm not going to introduce him yet, but we have a very special guest. Um, he is, uh, is not from the U.S., so we, he'll probably give us a lot of uh, perspective into like a more like a, like a global perspective into this topic. Uh, today we'll talk about meat nutrition. Um, and I guess before we start doing that, uh, how are you, Dr. Bass? I know we're going to be doing this, uh, this together. How yeah. you doing? Man, I'm excited. I'm just, I'm pumped up. I'm ready to go. Um, really excited to, to uh, visit with our guest that's here. And if it's okay, I'd, I'd love to, to kick it off and introduce that. Yeah, go for All it. All right. So, we, so, so everyone get ready. So we have um, Dr. Hamilton DeMello from uh, University of Nevada. And I have to be careful because you spent some time at University of Nebraska, right, with, with the amazing Dr. Calkins and, and the other uh, folks that were there. Um, but uh, at, while you're at the University of Nevada now, um, we know that you've been doing, uh, continuing along the academic route and, and learning. And um, what we'd love to hear is, you know, um, what, what are some of the research that you're working on? And, and specifically, Francisco has already set the stage. Tell us about some of, of the work that you're doing with how meat and nutrient content is, is important. Well, first of all, thank you guys for having me here today. It's a pleasure to be talking to you. Dr. Bez is, is a person that I, I already know. His reputation, his previous work at NCBA, it's great to talk to you. Uh, and Francisco is a, is a great guy. So I talked to you before too. Thank you very much for allowing me to be here. Well, so, um, you know, uh, I am, as you probably know, I'm the only meat science professor in Nevada for now. So we do have a, a position coming next year. Um, but, I, you know, coming to here, allow me to actually work in different areas. So most of times when you, uh, when you are a meat, science, meat scientist in a university that has more professors, you, you usually pick one single direction and you work or you're a muscle biologist, or you just work with the food safety, or you're just a quality guy with fresh meats, or you move to a direction that you are working with processing meats. So my, uh, you know, when I got here, it was just one person trying to actually implement a new research program. So now, extra doc, uh, as Dr. Bass said, I was, uh, you know, my PhD was in meat and muscle biology, and I was uh, advised by Dr. Calkins, who's a specialist in fresh meat. So we did have a very um, extensive background in fresh meats as well as microbiology because my uh, my master's was in focus on microbiology. So when I went, when I got here, you know, our department was actually uh, a merged department with the nutrition folks, and uh, uh, you know, I was reintroduced back as uh, to the nutrition side by interacting with these folks. So um, and since I had a background in food microbiology and a background in fresh meat. So I continue to work in that, um, both areas. And I also added the nutrition side because I did have a lot of support and folks that I could interact with. So I have basically three major lines of research right now. One is the food microbiology and you guys are familiar with. Mm -hmm. um, the second one is the fresh meats that we continue doing, studying basic, basically most of the other things that people like to see too how we improve meat quality and this novel uh area study area uh, that we we call like nutrigenomics right so this is something that we're trying to understand right now because uh, uh, we all meet scientists to try to uh, uh develop research that can be immediately applied towards the industry benefits or public health and and uh, uh you know i think that's that's are the three major research lines that I'm going right now. So it's the food, food safety, the quality in general, and the nutri nutrigenomics. 
And, and so in the, in the nutrigenomics and, and the omics topics are, are you know, that's the hot thing in, in a lot of the different sciences right now. So can, can you digest that a little bit down? <laughs> and I guess no pun intended, but let's digest that just a little bit. Tell us a little bit about the focus that you have in the nutrigenomics and, and maybe as you mentioned, how that can benefit public health by, sure. by consuming meat. Isn't that great? Yeah, absolutely. So the truth is, um, uh, the truth is that everyone knows about the effects of macronutrients, right? So why, why are you looking for nutrigenomics, dude? That's a question, right? So we all know that uh, protein causes this. We know the lipids cause this. We know the vitamins cause this. So this is macronutrients. Everyone knows what a, um, you know, a triglyceride is going to do to you, or omega-3 is going to do to you, or the vitamins iron, zinc, B12, B6, we know the benefits of that. They are well studied. But few people understand that when you consume meat, we're also consuming pieces of protein and small sequences of nucleotides that can actually be absorbed uh, by your intestinal tract through the epithelial cells. And they can actually uh, interact with these epithelial cells that we also generate another response that probably gonna affect the microbiota, or these guys can also reach the systemic, um, the, the, your blood vessels, and actually go target one specific gene that might be related to obesity, cancer, diabetes. Wow, okay, all right, so, so I'm, gonna, I'm gonna back up just a little bit because our, our, a lot of our listening audience is not in the full on academic mode. And so, so I'm going to, I'm going to try to digest a little bit what you said, and hopefully I'm getting it a little bit correct. So wrote down a lot of things, macronutrients. And of course that's like you said, water, um, uh, fats or lipids, um, protein, mi uh, minerals, vitamins, those kinds of things, things that keep us alive. Right. Um, and then you mentioned the nucleotides and just to remind folks, what are nucleotides? Well, deoxyribonucleic acid. It's, the, it's kind of the building blocks of DNA in some cases. And so okay. you're talking about there's specific things in meat that can be absorbed through the gut or, or remain in the gut and, and actually help in both ways. Is that what you're saying? That's 100% correct, Dr. Okay. Bates. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, what a cool thing. We already know that meat is just an amazing food. Not only does it taste good, but it's good for you right? But now your, your lab is experiencing some additional or researching some additional um, health beneficial factors um, that, that meat can just help that much more. That's correct. Yeah. And the, and the good thing is that we were, we were looking at both effects, right? Because as, as a scientist, we always need to keep our, our feet on the ground and, and be open to see all these results, right? Even yeah. they can be good or not. Right. Yeah. So, the truth is that, um, you know, as a meat scientist and, a, um, you know, I'm a meat promoter. Uh, I'm a meater. Uh, I was born and raised in a South American country that consumes meat more than a lot of people. Yes, they do. Uh, you know, I, yeah. So I probably have meat in my meals every day. So, and I, you know, I'm, I, I'm a huge meat fan. <laughs> yeah. But uh, the long story short is when I'm, I wanted to actually understand uh, some in individual impacts of, of the meat consumption on human health, uh, especially because there is this association with cancer. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, like a four or five years ago, the World, World Health Organization released a monography associating meat consumption to cancer. But guess what? You can't prove it. So right. it's not science based. Uh, well, although it's science based, it's not. Uh, uh, most of times, it's not, yeah, we do not have a, a, a great methodology to rely on. And there is this huge uh, 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 appeal for, hey, why are you eating meat? If this thing is bad for you. And mm -hmm. at the same time, we have the meat supporters that said, hey, you don't know what we're talking about. Right. right? So these guys have vitamins. These guys have <laughs> guys got minerals. They got protein. They have actually creatine that works in our muscle building, right? They have carnosine that actually helps with your muscle fatigue. Uh, and then you're not eating meat, so you're not having all the essential amino acids at the same time. And there's always this balance that we can't ignore as scientists. 
Right. And we yeah. need to come back and say, hey, take a look at that, right? So especially what you're talking about, you might be not knowing everything you're talking about. You just come right. up with conclusions that you probably are creating in your own head. Right, right. Well, I, I, I'm a total carnivore, and I know Francisco is as well. And we, we, I'm sure we both come from, uh, uh, you know, uh, groups of people who also put meat at the center of every meal. And so we... We agree. With Especially you. Yeah, absolutely. You, you be there. <laughs> you yeah. are the guy who's there. Yeah. <laughs> I have, I have uh, one thing as a follow up on that, and I think it's very important for our audience because uh, I, at first we started looking at meat processors, but also we have uh, grass students, we have consumers that really want to know about what they're eating. Uh, and this is a very good topic because now we're discussing more about that, more of the, as Dr. Bass brought it up more like the health benefit. And as a, as a very broad question, it's okay, it's okay if, I mean, it's a little bit off track, but it's along the same uh, topic. Um, talking about, because what we're saying is, we denature also proteins, but when we grill, when, get, when we're cooking, have you guys also looked at what types of, of um, cooking procedures, cooking processes, may affect the, I mean, the, because that, that ultimately is the nature of the protein, that affects um, the overall intake you know, when we talk about nutrition, Dr. Hamilton. Yeah, sure. And, and this was the initial, initial question that I had like three years ago, right? When you're talking now about DNA and RNA molecules, you know that RNA molecules are not super resistant to heat. And um, our first hypothesis, new hypothesis that was, can this thing survive? Is this, this thing, these micronates are not going to survive after cooking. That was our initial new hypothesis tested. And um, the interesting thing, man, is that, you know, we were not, we were extremely confident that that micronates would not be available after cooking. Mm. So and I worked uh, uh, with two more, Two more uh, uh, collaborators here. One is Dr. Brad Ferguson. He's from the, the nutrition side, and Dr. Moser from Seca. And then we sit down and said, "Hey, these RNAs, they're, they don't survive. That's why you collect RNAs right after uh, the animal is dead, or you need to do some biopsy because you're not going to be able to. They're not. They're not resistant. And and guess what? Right. So we realized that this, some of these microRNAs. Some of these micronates, they actually are overexpressed post mortem for 14 days. What wow. happens is you start with like a certain amount, and after the animal dies, dies, right? So that micronates are overexpressed, boom, boom, boom. They go into 14 days and boom, and come down. So that was the first discovery that I did say, hey, these guys probably are great biomarkers for something else. Uh -huh. Everything that happens post-mortem. So you have something growing right there. They're great biomarkers. Let's take a look at that in the other side. But since our focus were on nutrition, it said, okay, we have actually like twice more microRNAs after 14 days. So we actually increased that concentration of specific microRNAs. And we tested nine of them. So, and then the second question is, but what happens if we digest, if we cook? And what happens if you digest? Because I want to know if these micronates are going to reach my gut and they're going to be available there to be absorbed. So we actually cook them 70 degrees, right? We use the same procedure that we always Seven, do. 70 degrees Celsius for the Celsius. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, yeah. I forgot about it. 70 degrees Celsius. Yeah, yeah. come on, man. About 161 degrees Fahrenheit. Very good, yeah. yeah. That's right. 70 degrees Celsius, right? And uh, like, you know, we recommended by American Meat Science Association guidelines. And then, uh, um, four taste panel. And then, uh, uh, we digested that in vitro. So in that the digested material was analyzed to see how much microRNA we have in that digest, digested material. And we know, right, what you know, this, this science says that these guys are actually absorbed in phantograms, which is super minimal, minimal concentration. And when we analyzed our samples, digested samples, they came out in nanograms. It was a two more uh, units than we wanted. 
So theoretically, we have a significant amount of microRNAs that are being they're 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 reaching your your uh, uh, guts after passing through the duodenum, and they are there. They are they're, still available. Yeah. And so they're not being so so these microRNAs, so these these tiny little fragments of protein of stuff, that. right? Good. That so it's it's actually not give, it, it's not being um, broken down during cooking. It's not being broken down in our, in our rather acidic stomachs. It's actually making its way all the way to our intestines so that it can be absorbed. That's what you're saying. Yeah. One of the things that we cannot forget that this long chain is super long, right? Uh -huh. And the, these microRNAs can be generated by the degradation anyways. Okay. So the degradation of the dead DNA can actually generate uh, some microRNAs, but that's not what we're going after, right? We think we strongly believe that the microRNAs there, they actually are protected because there is a, a specific protein called agoprotein that actually englobes that microRNA and protects that guy through all that process. Mm -hmm. So and uh, if you look at the micro, microRNA biogenesis, right, which is something super fun, and I'm not going to be digging this right now, otherwise people are going to get crazy. I got that. <laughs> but I mean, so what happened is when you are, these microRNAs are actually going through their synthesis. So these guys are actually produced by a single messenger RNA. And there is a protein called AGO2 that actually holds that and protects that guy through a different, um, different process. And also, right, so when you're digesting, never forget that the lipids uh, are there too. Mm -hmm. And the yeah, lipids the can fat. actually, yeah. Yeah, yeah, they can bypass by holding that protein. Mm -hmm. And you will eventually have protein there that actually some kind of way protected. Yeah. So That's, because, isn't that fascinating? Biology is so cool. Yeah, it is so, cool. <laughs> so can and, you tell us what, so are there specific species that you're working with right now um, as far as the, the different meats? We are, we're working with beef right now. It would be predominantly your, <laughs> your beef guy. One, uh, I, that's all right. I, I'm okay with that. One, and the second one, we're going to be uh, beef against plate based. <laughs> <laughs> really? We're going to have a lot of fun right there because okay. we have micro vegetable micro RNAs too, right? Okay, sure. Yeah. 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 But yeah, we have all the, all these species coming, coming on the line. Yes. We have yeah. everything lined up. It's just a, it's just a, a, you know, a work that we are putting our heads. Like we started this like two years ago and uh, it's super novel. There are a lot of new, yeah. new stuff that we're looking after. Uh, we're having a lot of fun. That's are, the most important part. Well, yeah, and that's, I mean, of course, science is fun. Science is cool for those who, who those naysayers that are out there. <laughs> um, yeah, and uh, well, are there ways that you can actually adjust the nutrient content in meat, um, either, at, either at the really precise level that you're talking about or or say more on a grand scale for um, folks that are, that a lot of our listeners are, are, are packers processors. What are some things that they might be able to look at and tell their customers ultimately on what they should be looking for as far as meat nutrient content? Yeah. So I, I understand that this podcast is related to, let's talk about the industry a little bit. I think these yeah. guys are going to have a lot of fun, right? Yeah. So um, in, in my understanding, um, all the industries, not only the meat industry, right? So the industry works towards demand. So if you have a higher demand, right? If you have a higher demand for masks right now, right? Mm -hmm. Or for uh, uh, hand sanitizers, even Tesla is doing like hand sanitizers right now. So it's an opportunity for demands. So uh, in my understanding is in the future, uh, we will have more understanding about uh, what people want. So today there's a huge concern about grass fed and grain fed local, right? I want to get some omega threes. I would prefer to right. get grass fed beef, but we know meat scientists, we right. know that's one or 2% more. Yeah. So we, you'd have to, so for those listening, yeah. um, the data says you, I think you'd have to eat about 14 pounds of right. to, <laughs> right. to, be, to get the same amount as you get out of a three ounce salmon, which I try to eat 14 pounds of beef. <laughs> I do, but, but yeah, it's, you're not yeah, going to you're talking about we're, for other reasons. Right. <laughs> and, and I have these discussions with one of my, my students and, and, uh, you know, I say, Hey, uh, this amount that we increase by adding like a, by just using grass or other, uh, uh, you know, supplements that you increase like one or 2%. If you look at the, at the uh, uh, Western diet, that's like 21 omega-6, omega-3 ratio right now, mm -hmm. you're just 
adding this is not going to really affect yeah. anything. But guess what, right? The industry needs to be worried about that because that concern might actually lead people to consume something specifically, not related to science, but their own preference or their own, their own beliefs, right? So, um, you know, you're coming back to your question now, we don't know yet how, how much we can, uh, uh, we are actually running a trial right now. These animals are gonna be harvested like a, probably a week and a half, where uh, we're gonna actually look at the micro DNA profile of uh, animals fed different diets. Mm -hmm. So there are some things in the literature that actually show uh, the difference between um, animals fed different things, different feed stuff, some are than corn, some are than wheat, some are than grass. We had our own here, <clears throat> and you're gonna be able to come up with microRNA profiles from animals fed different fat feedstuffs. Really? And that obviously yeah. is we review a lot of things in there. And you brought up the, the, your hypothesis, what you, what you found was that on those 14 days postmortem, you found that those microRNAs, they went up. So let me go back and for those folks that are processing meat in those countries, South America and uh, Mexico, Central America, that we don't typically have what we call the wet aging process. Because, uh, I mean, we, we discussed that with Dr. Bass when we talk about beef tenderness, but they, they might have, a, depending on the genetics, we might have some differences when we talk about brucellosis or uh, the protein degradation, which makes meat more tender. So for those folks in those countries uh, that they typically will harvest the beef and maybe like in a couple of days later, you're gonna find it in the supermarket because that's typically um, the, the supply chain, that's how it works down there. So how, how would that affect that? I mean, would that, ha I mean, to, talking about the meat from those countries, they don't have those 14 days postmortem because just the, the market uh, the demand is like whatever you kill, whatever you harvest is going to be on the market uh, almost immediately. How, how would you say about that and some of the health benefits from those uh, look as two types of production? Uh, I, think that, I think that aging, it's, it's, it's not really intrinsically related to nutrition, I guess. You know, the, the nutrition values are going to be there. Um, I think that the age inside moves to more to the quality thing, uh, which uh, is something that Dr. Baz is actually probably studying right now because I am partially familiar with his research. And then, uh, um, you know, what I feel is that the nutritional, the nutrition side of, of uh, um, this is probably not related to the time spent post-mortem. Um, and we know that meat has 20% of protein, seven to 75 percent water what really varies there which will might change your nutritional values is your lipidomics right so what your come back to almonds right it's your lipids so uh you know we know you know i i personally believe that lipidomics is a very interesting thing but we we know that fatty acids and fats and cholesterol and triglycerides are triglycerides are the most important components related to health associated to meat and these guys vary from 10 to, from zero, from zero, from one to 10%. Uh, unless you're eating a Wagyu that, you know, is probably 25% of fat. But I mean, it's more associated to uh, the fat content and not the, uh, uh, um, you know, the time that's spent post-mortem. But guess what, right? So coming back to your question, and then you're saying, okay, why is this uh, increase of microRNA is important? right, for the industry in general, or for these guys. So you guys remember that I mentioned that I'm feeding two types of, of feedstuff in animals, right? And we know, so here's how micronase work. Micronase, they actually penetrate and go, they feed, they, 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 they reach the, 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 the blood system, and they go there and attach to a specific gene and turn that gene off. Don't forget, right, that genetic gene expression, is one of the most important things associated to cowpone and cowpastatin. Hmm. So this means that your initial, your initial microRNA profile 
might actually drive what genes are you expressing and you are suppressing. And these genes might be related to attributes that you want to know. And these are things know. that I cannot tell you yet. Right. <laughs> <laughs> that was probably future what, episodes. <laughs> future episodes. But this, but this <laughs> comes back to what you guys want to know related to the industry, right? Why this, this uh, crazy research is more applied to the industry in general, not only to the public health. Because they, this nutrigenomics thing is all about public health, but what the industry has with it. So if you were able, are, you were able to identify what microRNAs are being expressed and overexpressed in postmortem, and you depend on the postmortem timeline to have specifically final attributes that you want, oh, you need to know what microRNAs you want to have there. Just put a bug behind your ears. Right. Yeah. <laughs> you know. Yeah. Well, you know, when you bring up so many. <laughs> crazy awesome different directions that you know we talk about the rabbit hole that we all kind of end up going down in the academics and as we continue with research and and you know that's it i think that's important to stay open-minded about yeah. um, some of these really precise um, what we call basic research, right? To, to understand the tiny little molecules that can ultimately affect a lot of things later on. And, and that's kind of the, the premise that I'm hearing here. You know, that's there's, right. there's a lot of different, a lot of different things that we still don't know about meat science and, and, and see, we're, we're learning. And you see, Dr. Bass, going back to all the mitochondria mm -hmm. behavior, mm -hmm. right? All proteins that we need to give you proper color right mm -hmm. yeah. you know all of these are mediated by genes right yeah and yeah if and if you, know, you can turn them on or off <laughs> and if you can turn it on and off yeah. you can make a mess or you can improve it right <laughs> <laughs> well, well let's hope we continue to improve on that let's let's lean in that direction shall right. we so, <laughs> well we believe we can improve that's i believe most, that too that's i most, believe that's why we study that, right? To come up with like, solutions that can uh, provide a betterment, betterment for the, all the industry and, and meat quality in general. Yeah, yeah. Well, and, all right. and I, I, I'd like to ask one follow-up question and, and maybe that could kind of wrap the discussion up here. Um, but, uh, you know, we, we do have to continue to investigate and we do have to continue to use different thoughts and different minds. And this, this kind of round table that we're having right here is a pretty cool example of how we have have representatives from United States. We have, we have a representative originally from Mexico. We have a representative originally from Brazil. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to point at you, Dr. Hamilton. Um, can you tell the audience just a little bit about your original background? And you, I mean, you got a DVM, um, and then you decided to come all the way up here to the United States and spend some time researching and continue on with a PhD. And that's, that's absolutely incredible. And you also mentioned you came from Brazil, which definitely has a different culture and a very beef centric totally, culture, right? Totally different so culture. Maybe, maybe just wrap the, wrap the discussion up on what it is that, that maybe drives your interests um, and, and maybe how that gives you kind of a different perspective to the U.S. and North American beef industry and then all the others that, that you've experienced along the way. Yeah, sure. You know, I, I was born and raised in a small town and uh, we were always being involved in farm activities since I was young. And, um, you know, in order to, and when, I was at, when I was working on my DVM, when I was a vet school, in order to have a good job, a good position in the meat industry in Brazil, we need to be a veterinary, right? Or you can work and, and get your bachelor's in animal science there and you probably, but if you were a veterinarian, right? So most of the veterinarians are, uh, you know, actually being absorbed by the, 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 the industry. The meat, if, if there is an industry that absorbs veterinary and veterinarians and pay them well, it's, it's actually the meat industry in Brazil. Okay. So uh, this is why I decided when it was in my like fourth year, uh, fourth year vet school, uh, you know, I took, I took meat science classes mm -hmm. and, uh, and I said, well, I want to work with production. I want to be a veterinarian that works with production. So, uh, and then after I, my internships were two major big plants right there. And after two major big plants, I decided, oh, I want to know more. I want to know more. So I went to the master's and got my master's at Sao Paulo State University, uh, was like a microbiology focused on. And at that time, I was reading a lot of papers. I, was, I, got, I got into science, right? So I got into science. And I had an opportunity to, to uh, 
read a lot of things from uh, uh, you know American scientists, right? And then and uh, I finished my 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 masters. I started my PhD in Brazil uh, for after two years. Um, I applied for a Fulbright scholarship. So and the Fulbright actually awarded me a four year uh, scholarship to come to the U.S. and get my PhD here. Yeah. So after this Fulbright. I needed to go back to Brazil. I stayed two years back. I, I came here, got my PhD, went back to, uh, to Brazil for two years. And I was teaching in a vet school right there, like mid science courses. Yeah. And then after two years, I was hired by a company. So they brought me back. After three, three five years, three, three, three to point five years, three, three years and a half in that company, um, my desire for research and labs and, and crazy stuff that I keep doing, don't dream, don't, don't stop dreaming yeah. and don't sleep anymore. So I, it's time to go back to academia. Mm -hmm. So I ended up coming back to academia. Yeah. <laughs> that's the story. Of that. well, and that's, that's an awesome direction. And, and the Wolf Pack is, I'm sure, very happy to have you. Um, so thank you so much for joining us. Oh, thank you very much. And, and uh, just uh, something that I forgot about your question. Um, I think that the beef industry in the United States is amazing. It's, uh, it's something that we cannot see anywhere. I've been in several countries before, right? The quality, the meat quality, the consistency that we have in the U.S., you can find anywhere. And then uh, uh, all of these is, you know, is fantastic. And that's what probably drives me to keep looking for things that can make this better and better and better. That's yeah. Awesome. Thanks. Well, thank you, Dr. Hamilton, for your time again, for being on this podcast. Uh, it was, it was fantastic uh, having this conversation, dialoguing with you. Um, we hope to see you in future episodes and having more uh, round tables with you. We appreciate it. And, and uh, we'll see you the next time. Thank you a lot. Oh, it's always a pleasure to be here. Thank you very much, Francisco. We want to thank our sponsors for their leadership and support.